we have already more than 50 participants so i will slowly start introducing the panel it's time it's great to see you all here so uh, as you see, we, we have a great uh, panel. The adaptation strategy has just been launched earlier this week and there has already been a lot of discussion uh, yesterday in, in this format here at, at, uh, organized by CMCC and we are very happy and grateful for that. And uh, today we want to look at the, the, the chapter of the adaptation strategy that is focusing on stepping up international action for climate resilience. And uh, we have, of course, a, a very uh, exciting panel here for you. Um, we have uh, basically uh, a combination of, of representatives from the academia and, and also from international organizations or, or development organizations and so on. Um, and, and I will just quickly give you an overview of the, the organization of the panel and then also on the organization sort of on the individual speakers and then we will just uh, jump right into it. Um, so basically, uh, we have a first set of, of, of impulse presentations where the speakers will give a, a short sort of reflection on how their work actually relates to uh, the, the, the adaptation strategy or how the adaptation strategy relates to their work and, and also in which way sort of this international dimension is relevant uh, in, in, their, in their work. And now I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, that, that we have these different representatives here. And, and I would like to start with uh, uh, Bina Desai. Uh, she's the head of programs at the International Displacement Monitoring Center uh, at the, at, at the um, uh, also uh, aligned with the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. And um, uh, yeah, we also have Tessa Schmeding uh, from the EU Affairs Expert in the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and Martin van Aal, the director of the Red Cross Red Cretion Climate Center in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, Daniel Stadtmüller from the, uh, the German Center for International Cooperation. And, uh, he's a team leader there at the INSU Resilience Secretariat. So those are the representatives from more the organizational institutional perspective. And then we have two representatives um, from, from, from the academia. So that's Katie Harris, a senior expert at the Stockholm Environment Institute and, and Bart van den Herk, uh, a uh, yeah, research advisor at Delta Res in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, I'm myself also a representative of, of uh, a research institute. I work at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And uh, together with Katie and Bart, we are very active in the uh, two big EU projects that are working on this topic. So that's why we sort of have this, this role here. Um, yeah, without any further uh, discussions or talking, I would like to, to open the floor. And the idea is, uh, because we have this project focus, that we start with a joint presentation from, from Bart and Katie to sort of set the scene. And then we will have the, uh, the other panelists sort of uh, uh, present their uh, part on it. And then in the second round of the panel, we will work our way backwards and sort of come back from the um, from from the from the end of the panel to to back to the to to where we started. Okay, so please, Bart, I would like. I think you are starting, so please go ahead and then I'd switch to uh, Casey at the appropriate time. Yes, thank you, Christopher, um, and welcome to this session. Indeed, I am Bart van den Hurk. I'm uh, uh, working at Delta and leading the uh, call, uh, project called Receipt, which is indeed. Um, exploring uh, the, the degree to which the European, the European Union is sensitive to climate impacts that occur outside its uh, territories. And uh, we jointly work on this work uh, together with another project, uh, Cascades, and uh, Katie Harris is here as well, and she will follow my presentation after mine. Um, the fact that we are worried about remote effect, uh, impacts has been quite uh, evident from last year's experience of uh, Corona, but it wasn't the only thing that happened that demonstrated how cross-connected this world is. If we just look at the, the situation of the, the global food uh, web, the global food uh, infrastructure, there was a huge outbreak of locusts in, in the Horn of Africa in the Middle East. As I said, the corona, uh, it, it really had large effects on, on supply disruptions, but not only supplies, also the demands uh, changed. 
there was lots of crops that were left unharvested at the fields because farm labor couldn't get there. Uh, national stock policy changed the uh, bilateral interactions and trade uh, affairs. And last but not least, as every year, at some places on the planet, there were uh, disruptive climatic features that also uh, hindered uh, climate uh, food production, like uh, major droughts in Europe and uh, South America, and there's many more to mention. So this really shows how connected we are, and, and we, we, we really learn a lot. Uh, for sure, from, from, from this corona, I think it really raised some awareness about that connectivity. It's also about how shocks propagate through a system. We were surprised how fast this, this whole pandemic was spreading out and what the, 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 the cascade of impacts was. We, we were surprised to see how, say, connected and, and systemic actually the whole trade uh, system responded to it. It wasn't only the supply, it wasn't only the demand, it was the, everything, the stocking, the distribution, the planning, the, 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 the unemployment, everything was touched by this. And Last but not least, we also show that the, the impacts aren't spread out equally over the population. And uh, as very often, the resilience of those people that are most vulnerable are, is affected uh, uh, unequally more than, than the ones that are better protected. I'm, I'm just quoting a study that just came out uh, very recently from, uh, from uh, the uh, uh, piloted by the group that Christopher is representing from, from Big Potsdam. And this is analyzing um, uh, the, uh, the global dimensionality of uh, the food crisis that was occurring in 2008 and 2010. And for 2010, we remember that there was this major heat wave uh, uh, episode in, in Russia taking place that really had a negative impact on the crop yield production, wheat production in that area. And uh, for you can see on the, on the plot uh, below on the left hand side, you see where there were uh, anomalies in the amount of wheat that was produced. But then if we look at how actually the, uh, the combination of, uh, say, production losses, but also export restrictions actually work out in, in, on the global uh, world, then we look at the right hand side of the map. And then you see actually that the Russian area shows not a negative impact because they were able to limit their exports to a large extent, could build up some stocks and make use of old stocks. But it didn't apply similarly to poorer countries that didn't have a shock. And there, say, the net effect of the availability of wheat in this case was dramatically reduced because of that. And it's just a simple illustration of what, what happens to, to the, the global system whenever there is at some location a disruption of the, 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 the production or something. Well, as an academic, uh, we try to, you know, condense this very complex picture into something that is tangible, that we can analyze. So uh, uh, the, the Cascades group, they, they are, have uh, submitted a paper that is, that is making a schematic that, that is used to analyze this kind of connected uh, uh, events and, 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 and pressures. And we, we think of this as sort of an, an, a connected system where at remote places, say climate triggers can propagate or can transmit to uh, via some kind of an, you know, a transmission pathways that, that can involve many, many modalities. I can show a few examples in a minute. And in the end, we'll end up at a place very different from where it all started. And at that place, there will be responses that may feed back on either the transmission pathway or the climate trigger. And we can analyze this whole system for, say, a present climate setting. We can calibrate it with, with, with current uh, data on climate and trades or whatever. But we can also make projections for this in a future setting by re of, by redoing, say, these kind of, of, of shock analysis in, in future climate conditions. And in this paper, there, there was also a schematic uh, designed where we can distinguish, disentangle different types of climatic pressure that can be events or slow onset. There is different ways of, of uh, connectivity, so they can be physical, like via trade, but they can also even be mental, that, that, we, that uh, there is a psychological shock because we realize how exposed we are or something like that. So there is different ways how these teleconnections work and there is different propagation pathways. There is different ways where, where there is multiple players at stake, where there is local feedbacks or amplifiers, etc. And it is a theory that is, that, that is uh, uh, still in a theoretical framework, but we use this as a framework to really analyze 
the kind of say globalized events and and uh, uh, networks that may exp be exposed to to climatic uh, pressures and may have unexpected and global impacts as just one example in in the RISC project we looked at uh, for instance uh, the, the soy production and uh, the degree to which europe is uh, uh, dependent on imports of soy for uh, mainly for, for for cattle feeding and uh, there is this analysis where you can see in blue shadings the areas which are the predominant uh, suppliers of soy but you can convolute that and combine that with analysis of where actually drought risk is, is experienced in, in a given period or in even a given year. And this is just an example of a drought exposure map uh, uh, overlapping with the soil production areas in, in, in the Americas. And in the project, we are now analyzing the, the, the consequence of the 2012 major drought that both occurred in the US and in the Brazilian area of, uh, of the soil production. And we are now mapping, say, the climate, climatic features in these areas, the, the yield productions, and, and then also the, the, the consequences in, in terms of the trades and the imports and, and the, the local consequences. And this, this will then, of course, be, be repeated in, in, in future settings where we will change maybe the climatic exposure, but we can also change, say, the ability of the, the European sector to cope with these kinds of things. And that is, I think, a crucial element of the analysis. It is really our resilience against these kinds of shocks or episodes really depends a lot on, on very basic questions. Is Do we follow, say, the paradigm of building back better and we just build more resilience and more sturdy alternative supply routes? Or do we really consider our mere dependence? And do we also appreciate that this whole teleconnection and, and, and the globalized network has many, many side effects that are maybe also not that desirable? And that is, that of course, is still ongoing. We're uh, uh, more, just a bit more than a year on our way, but we are really eager to, to, uh, to show, uh, to get grip on this very complex world of a uh, climate change impacts in a totally globalized world. I leave it for here and I propose to immediately sh uh, skip over to Katie and then we can uh, collect questions in the, the, the round later. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Bart. And just as you suggested, please, Katie, take the floor for your part. Great. Thanks so much. Pleasure to be here today. So Bart has run through really comprehensively what we mean by these international or cascading uh, aspects of, of climate risks, um, but how can we best respond to or manage these sorts of risks? So I'm going to spend a few minutes running through how we've thought about this from a conceptual perspective uh, from Receipt and Cascades, to talk through a practical example showing why we have to also consider the, the ripple out effects of our adaptation actions and end with the opportunities that we think the new EU adaptation strategy provides. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to talk you through this slide. So, so how might we approach this question conceptually? So in addition to the impact transmission system, this idea of impacts uh, propagating through a system that Bart focused on, we've also conceptualized a response transmission system in, in, in this conceptual framework, outlining some of the different ways to adapt to or respond to the risk of a cascading climate impact. And this can be either anticipatory or reactive. And you can see that there in the, the green box on the left of your screen. And for instance, moving to the top right of, then of the screen, we've thought about the different points at which adaptation options or interventions can be targeted. So perhaps at the source, the very initial impact from the climate hazard, or through interventions that target one or more of the impacts being propagated throughout the system. Uh, or perhaps at the site where the risk is ultimately experienced, or perhaps more indirectly through influencing a third party to intervene, for instance. And of course, also by interventions that mitigate the causes of climate change and directly affect the trigger, but we, we haven't shown that in the conceptual framework here. We've also conceptualized some of the very different dynamics that affect our responses and interventions, and you can see some of those on the bottom right that actors might target critical points of vulnerability uh, in the system, such as a major choke point in a supply chain, or they might put up blocks or barriers to prevent or slow these sorts of cascading impacts, or they might substitute or diversify to reduce or spread the risk. 
that actors' abilities to respond will vary according to their economic or political sphere of influence, and that there might be different sorts of interventions depending on whether actors organise their responses individually to these sorts of risks or act collectively as a group. And of course, interventions might not only be targeted exclusively towards adverse impacts, but, but may be directed towards harnessing benefits and opportunities too. And of course, reality is likely to be far more complex than this framework uh, presents, but, but we hope that this, this sort of thinking can help improve our climate risk assessments to reveal some of the important system dynamics or to gain insights into particular leverage points for building resilience in these complex systems, and also to reveal some of the opportunities for global cooperation and integrated planning on adaptation. So Bart, if we can just go to the next slide, please. So what does this look like from a policymaker's perspective? So Bart has talked a little bit about soy. I'm going to talk you through a quick example uh, focusing on rice. So rice is a top staple food in Senegal, uh, especially in fast growing cities. And um, most rice that is consumed is imported from countries in Asia. And Southeast Asia produces much of its rice in low-lying coastal and delta zones that will become increasingly exposed to sea level rise and other climate hazards. And this means that Senegalese policymakers and adaptation planners not only need to understand the impacts of climate change within their national borders, they also need to understand the impacts of climate change on their rice imports, for instance, including on rice production in Asia. And they need to understand the possible adaptation actions or policy responses of other countries in the global rice market to changes in supply. So comparatively small amounts of rice are traded internationally, so prices can fluctuate really significantly when countries suddenly enter or leave the international rice market. And this happened in 2007 to 8 when India halted its exports of rice, partly due to poor harvest uh, forecast forecast because of adverse climatic conditions. And this led to panic buying by major uh, rice importers such as the Philippines and further restrictions by major other major rice exporters such as uh, Vietnam in order to stabilize their own domestic rice prices. But this chain reaction around world markets saw prices skyrocket by over 200% in local markets in Senegal leading to protests on the streets. So I tell you this story because it shows us that adaptation strategies that make sense at a national level, such as restricting exports during food crises, may exacerbate risks at the global level. And in a complex and dynamic system, responses are likely to have unintended consequences and cascading effects far beyond the jurisdictions of the decision makers that implement them. And the same can potentially be said for adaptation actions taken in Europe. So if climate change, for instance, caused production of a key imported commodity, such as coffee, to decline, then roasters and retailers in Europe are going to take a hit, but they can adapt by diversifying their supply. The impact is likely to be far more painful for abandoned smallholder farmers who rarely have unemployment insurance or a financial buffer to draw on, and who could face if you like the double whammy of both direct climate change impacts and the adverse effects of adaptation decisions uh, taken by European importers. And these are really important challenges and trade-offs for decision makers to manage. So without considering cross-border effects, can we really be sure that our adaptation is reducing vulnerability rather than redistributing it? So what does this mean for EU policy? So in Europe, the risks associated with remote climate impacts, or oh, Bart, if you can just go back to the previous slide, just for one more second. Thanks. So the risks associated with remote climate impacts will be heightened or reduced uh, depending on policies and interventions, not only in individual member states, but also collectively at EU level. And as we've seen, responses to cascading climate risks can take many forms, including through international cooperation, to build resilience in some of these high risk uh, areas and regions. So this means, as the EU adaptation strategy notes, that adaptation actions must not be limited to climate policies alone, but rather be integrated into a wider policy mix, uh, spanning things like international cooperation, migration, trade, agriculture and security. Uh, and given the cross-border nature of climate risk, 
Uh, coherence between the policies of different countries and geographic scales will also be important. So the EU will need to both promote policy coherence within its borders, as it notes in the new strategy, but also encourage other states to promote policy coherence beyond its borders as well. And we might even need to think of arbitration mechanisms that can help adjudicate on the trade-offs between different policy interests when it hasn't been possible to identify win-win solutions. So the policy coherence, as you can see here on the right of the screen, is really important. And then just final slide, thanks, Bart. Just to sum up, um, so the existence of cascading climate risk uh, shows the need for all countries, regions and international organisations to step up cooperation for a climate resilient future. And we're looking forward to supporting this in the Cascades project uh, by creating a multi-level governance framework uh, to look at how we might manage these cascading climate risks in Europe and a policy analysis framework um, to drive the generation of coherent recommendations. The 2013 EU adaptation strategy, strategy didn't have much of a focus on the cascading nature of climate risk and it's really promising that this new strategy outlines the EU's intentions to do more following recognition of this as a major gap in the 2018 evaluation. And cascading, these sorts of cascading climate risks are really weaved throughout the strategy. And just I've just included a few uh, quotes from the strategy here on the, sli here on the slide. So we really welcome the explicit recognition that climate, uh, the impacts of climate change have these knock-on effects across borders, that the EU already is and will increasingly be affected by climate impacts outside Europe, and that this makes international climate resilience not only a matter of solidarity, uh, but also of, of open strategic autonomy and self-interest for the EU and its member states. Uh, that solidarity is essential to achieving resilience in a just and fair way. Uh, and the, the, the actions that the Commission will take to stimulate cooperation regionally and across borders uh, and the actions the Union will take to deepen political engagement on, on climate change adaptation with international and regional partners. Um, there's also a fantastic emphasis in the strategy on the, this, the important topic of policy coherence, building on the EU's leadership role on this and on just resilience uh, as, as a guiding concept for climate adaptation. So just before, uh, I'm aware my time is up, Christopher, but just to say, I think the, the EU and the rest of the world are inescapably intertwined. Um, and really to manage cascading climate risks, the EU will need mechanisms and forums and dialogues that go beyond financing for adaptation. It will need an approach to adaptation that's much more collaborative, that identifies and recognises our global interdependencies and builds on areas of common ground with partners internationally, both public and private. We would make the case that adaptation really is a global public good um, and it's up to a broad range of actors in, in, in Brussels, but also beyond now to make that vision a reality. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you a lot, Katie. That, that was very enlightening. And as you see, uh, we also already have questions in the Q&A facility. So it's just to let you know uh, for the audience, you can of course always post questions there and the experts will in the meantime also try to answer those, but we have a dedicated Q&A session also uh, a bit later in this session, but you can already start posting questions because people, if we use this Q&A tool can already look at it and reply in a much better way than if we use the chat function. So thanks a lot for the first part a person to, to post a question there. And now uh, we can move on uh, to Martin. Uh, Martin, can I give you the floor? Please, uh, we are looking forward to your contribution. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, great perspectives already from Bart and Katie. And um, I think you've made the case um, as well as anyone could that this is um, uh, a topic that deserves the attention that the strategy is fortunately giving it. So I was very pleased to see, to see first of all, that it is such a prominent chapter, that it is recognized, that the risks in the EU are connected to those in the rest of the world, and that the EU also bears responsibility for how risks beyond its borders are being managed. So uh, uh, I think that's something we should all recognize and celebrate. But then um, the second is uh, sort of going through the, the various priorities. Actually very pleased to see what is being recognized very explicitly as what needs to be done to manage those risks. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done to now put that in practice. So that's maybe also where 
we could focus some of our discussion today to see where we still have uh, barriers or, or gaps that need to be addressed. Uh, I think one, and I'll, I'll come back to a few suggestions like this at the end of, of my short remarks, um, one is around knowledge and um, the sort of discussion platforms that these projects are also providing. Uh, but there's, there's clearly several others. And I think there are some very practical steps we can take there. And one of those is actually to do what Katie just also suggested already. It, it's not about just finding it's about adaptation projects. Um, in a way, an adaptation strategy serves just adaptation is something you can do on its own as one strategy and often then results in adaptation projects trying to do this one thing. I think one thing that's really good to see in the strategy is actually it is a much more systemic challenge and a very different approach. So, um, then the question is, what does that then mean for that engagement in, in all those different places? So let me make five points and then come to, to a few um, uh, implications. So the first point, great that international is there. The second, I think it's good to see that it recognizes that we're not looking at this sort of gradual trend perspective on climate, but that we're dealing with shocks and surprises, uh, that there's a question of decision making under uncertainty involved here as well, um, but also that there is um, a whole tool set to manage these risks across timescales. Um, and frankly, in the UNFCCC, this is also where adaptation also starting to blend into loss and damage. Uh, we are seeing impacts around us. There's on the one hand, a real challenge because we cannot just think about a long-term gradual transition to a future climate where we can have a data first design. We also need to think about how we deal with those impacts right now. It's also an opportunity because it allows us to talk about climate change and raise awareness and engage with stakeholders in very different ways. One thing we've done in the international humanitarian system, in the, the Red Cross and Red Crescent, but also with many other humanitarian agencies, is a much stronger focus on anticipatory action across timescales. So where 10 years ago, most of the humanitarian work was happening after the fact, we now have systematic approaches where we have so-called early action protocols, similar to uh, the step that we would have on the shelf for when some bad, bad disaster happened somewhere. We now have similar procedures for when a forecast arrives of a certain severity and that triggers automatic actions beforehand. And the sort of risk information you need to set those things up is also the sort of risk information that informs where we can anticipate risks and, and, and thus what capacities need to be put in place in the, the places most affected. It also starts hinting at where you need to invest in different types of structural interventions, longer term risk management, but also where you start facing limits to adaptation. And I think that's another important concept that we should be starting to talk more about. Um, when can we no longer adapt using our, our existing tool sets? Um, a third component in terms of that dealing with shocks, but also with surprises is also that we're seeing increasingly that risk management itself is sometimes starting to create new risks. Uh, and this is something that's also quite prominent in our uh, look at risks in the uh, sixth assessment report in the IPCC. Whereas I think in the AR5, one big transition was that we started to look at risks as the, the, the convolution of, of um, uh, climate hazards with uh, exposure and vulnerability. We now actually see the way we then manage those changing risks, uh, including the mitigation, but also the adaptation elements, is starting to generate new risks and distributional impacts uh, beyond just the distributional impacts of what climate is doing to us. Also, the solutions are creating those effects. And one example that's, that's probably easiest for everyone to, to relate to is, you know, a, a piece of coast where you build some hard seawall to protect people from uh, rising seawaters, but then it actually changes the coastal morphology and people further, further down the coast are, are hit worse. Uh, water uh, distribution uh, along a river uh, is another way. It might help some people cope with uh, uh, increasing rainfall variability, but it might also make people downstream worse off. So these sorts of uh, challenges are coming up much faster. And of course, then a uh, particular concern also for us, so that's my third point um, from a humanitarian perspective, is that focused on the most vulnerable. And again, it's prominent in this energy, but doing it in practice is, is quite a different thing. And, and we actually see these distributional issues and play other than to their advantage despite all the good intentions. Um, a particular challenge here, and again, good to see this um, uh, pointed out in the strategy at least, is um, the, the fragility and armed conflict contexts. Where actually, if you look at our international climate architecture right now, it almost excludes the ability to deliver in conflict contexts. Whereas actually, if you see, for instance, where we see people suffering most from climate shocks, say also the indirect shocks like food security, it is in places like Somalia, Yemen, South Sudan, you name them. So what can we do there? And 
that's where this this focus on this um, humanitarian development peace adaptation sort of quadruple nexus as, as i'd like to to call it is really important another component there and again good to see that for focus within europe but also internationally is a focus on local action this can only be done if sort of national governments fixing this or in some cases fixing across border dimensions needs to be localized and through systemic approaches we're connecting different areas of legislation in governments, for instance, but also linking to subnational layers of governance is, is really critical. So quick implications, and I know I'm running out of time as well. Um, so integrating this, this um, adaptation vision that is so well articulated in the strategy into lots of different instruments in the EU. So that includes ECHO, it includes INPA, it includes NIR, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think this concept of anticipation of risks across timescales is really important. The new ECHO uh, disaster preparedness guidance that is coming out shortly is a good example of that. And I think there's really strong linkages of where some of these existing um, pieces of, of work in, in different parts of the uh, commission can, can already facilitate the, the implementation of this strategy. And then and finding the mechanisms to enable that local action. Um, we shouldn't dive into the whole climate financing architecture, but I, I, I think there's challenges to address there as well as this element of awareness and capacity. And I think we're starting to line that out for Europe in the context of Horizon Europe, but I think we need a similar effort also focusing particularly on how to do this also internationally. And then finally, in terms of the scale of the challenge, I think coming out of the COVID crisis right now, I think what we really need is some sort of Marshall Plan, a solidarity fund to internationally, not just um, recover from this risk, but also create a world that's more resilient to future ones. And um, I think the community clearly, to some extent, probably preaching to the converted, around the table here also needs to ensure that the EU recognizes that to deliver on this strategy requires a major step up in ambition and in financing. Uh, and I think um, this is the year, if any, to really do that and deliver on that. Uh, and once again, um, from, from our side as a humanitarian network, I think us collectively in the academic world are, are happy to contribute to that, but it also requires bold political decisions. And I think we should all be reaching out to our fellow citizens in all EU countries also to uh, build that political momentum. Thank you. So thanks a lot. I'm, I'm sure we will come back to this uh, in, in, in the discussion a lot. Um, uh, I would like to give the floor to, to Tessa from the uh, UN um, uh, Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and because, yeah, because time is short, I, I will not speak much. Uh, I will give you a bit more uh, insights from, from my perspective uh, later. Please, uh, Tessa, go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the floor, um, and it's very excited to be it's exciting to be on this panel. And um, there have been some very um, well uh, motivating things or um, things that have been said that uh, we can very much um, uh, uh, echo and uh, and align with. Um, I'll maybe give a little bit of an introduction to uh, UNDRR. I hope you can all see my my slide. Um, well, uh, so UNDRR, so the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, is the UN focal point for reducing disaster risk um, and the custodian for the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, um, which is an international agreement um, that was endorsed by UN member states in 2015 um, and lays out seven targets for achieving a a substantial reduction in mortalities, uh, people, number of people affected, uh, economic losses, um, and damage to critical infrastructure. So UNDRR has a, a global scope, and within that I work for the Regional Office for Europe, which covers 55 um, countries in Europe and Central Asia. Um, and as part of the mandate of UNDRR, it supports stakeholders and partners to think and act differently um, about disasters, really shifting that focus from uh, picking up the piece pieces post-disaster to um, risk-proofing the start of any development investments. Um, and as we know, climate change uh, really manifests itself in the form of disasters, which uh, demonstrates the importance of the coherence here between uh, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, um, as they're really one side of the well, two sides of the two sides of the same coin, really. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would like to uh, go into. Um, what was also mentioned in the EU adaptation strategy um, that disasters over the last two decades have very much increased. Um, so recorded disasters um, and economic losses have almost doubled in the last 20 years, as can be seen in the, the figures um, of the UNDRR's um, Human Cost of Disaster Report. So if, if we look at this, um, if we look at the period between 
2000 and 2019, there were 7,348 major uh, recorded disasters, of which um, 6,681 disasters were climate related, um, which is a significant uh, increase from the 3,656 climate related disasters that were in the period um, from 1980 to 1999. And much of this sharp increase can um, be related to uh, the, the rising climate related disasters um, and the intensity and frequency of climate related disasters is only expected to increase. So UNDR looks at um, the um, full range of risks, but as we've seen um, in these numbers that over 90% of disasters are climate related, which is why um, yeah, climate change is indeed an important part of our work. Um, and well, what has been exemplified by um, the COVID-19 pandemic is that um, yeah, it, it, it demonstrates what happens if we do not prepare for a disaster. Um, and here we're going into much of what has uh, been very well explained uh, by, by Katie and Bart um, about risk being systemic and um, and, well, the, and, and crises cascading. So disasters are rapidly producing further disasters to become more complex and deadly. Um, and also the pandemic has, has shown the consequences of systematically underinvesting in resilience. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's very important that we, we, we focus on this um, because the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic have really added to existing stresses and shocks, um, including those linked to, to climate change. Um, so really more than ever before, we need to address this systemic uh, nature of, of risks and, and strengthen resilience and adapt our, our societies uh, to these new realities. Um, so, and also as mentioned by, by Bart and, and by Martin, uh, there, there were the, like the, the aspect of um, um, the vulnerable populations, it, it's, 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 you, you have disasters affecting everyone, but um, not everyone is affected equally. Um, so it's very important to um, make sure that we reduce the added vulnerability that can result from disaster impacts and ensure that no one is left behind. Um, so this brings me to the, um, well, the important point of um, ensuring coherence between climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. As the also stressed in the um, EU adaptation strategy, uh, climate adaptation action must better leverage synergies with broader work on disaster risk reduction and prevention, um, because both um, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation provide a, a, a range of complementary approaches to managing climate risks um, in order to really build a, a more resilient society. Um, so UNDR is working on, uh, on building this coherence, enhancing this coherence th through multiple means, um, such as through support to the development of disaster risk reduction strategies. So um, currently over 100 countries uh, now have a disaster risk reduction strategy in place um, in line with the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Um, and the Sendai framework also really underlines this importance of the coherence between disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Um, we, we also uh, work closely uh, within the UN system, um, so across UN agencies um, and UN country teams, uh, to really be able to leverage um, our capacities uh, to integrate these two um, agendas, so of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. And really also what, uh, what's important looking ahead um, is, is really to be able to implement and finance these, these strategies. This will be um, very important uh, because it, it, as was also mentioned before, um, we have to really take this opportunity of, of COVID-19 um, and ensure that the recovery plans are, are used to, to build back better, to um, have uh, risk-informed um, investments made. Um, so this is, it, it's, it's yeah, really important to integrate disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation um, at all levels. 
uh, sort of, sort of like local, the regional, uh, national, international, um, which is fantastic that this um, uh, strategy has an international dimension. Um, so we're very happy to see that. Um, and also, for example, we're also happy to see that um, the, the Portuguese uh, EU presidency is um, uh, um, prioritizing disaster risk reduction in the humanitarian development nexus uh, approach. Um, I think this can also be nicely linked to the quadruple uh, <laughs> nexus approach that was mentioned, I think, by Marta. And um, yeah, so we, UNDR is, is really working on, on scaling up disaster risk reduction in humanitarian action. Um, because, well, it, it, as you, well, it, it, there are recent reports that have um, have shown that for every $100 uh, spent on development aid um, between 2010 to 2018, disaster risk reduction only received um, well, 47 cents to the $100. So that's um, <laughs> not very much. And it's very important to step up this action. Um, and uh, yeah, so once again, it's great that the EU adaptation strategy really um, it, it has this extern external dimension um, through which uh, it, it plans important actions to, to take in this regard. Um, and what on the UNDRR side we're also going to be doing is uh, we have the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction in November, which is hosted by Portugal, and we'll be bringing um, all of uh, our, our 55 um, member states together um, to really look at a transformative um, response to driving a resilient and green uh, economic recoveries. Um, so th this will have like a, a very strong focus on this. Um, I think it's uh, very, very timely also to have this, this strategy and to see where it's going to be taken in, in terms of implementation. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tessa. That was very interesting. And, and I, uh, again, invite you all to use the Q&A facility. It's already going on quite actively there. So please post your questions there. That's the way we, we uh, want you, the audience, to be engaged here. So uh, the next um, uh, contribution is from Bina Desai from the International Displacement Monitoring Center. So please, uh, Bina, you can start your video and... Uh, uh, go ahead with your statement. And Thank you very much, Christopher. I think I hope my video is still running and that you can see me. And first up, many thanks to Yaroslav Musiak and the whole CMCC team for organizing this whole series of what I think are really interesting uh, discussions and events. I will focus a little bit on um, a very visible and yet surprisingly hidden um, aspect of climate change impact, and that's on displacement. Uh, it's visible because we're talking about millions of people on the move every year, um, and yet hidden, uh, relatively speaking, um, in national and regional debates, uh, but also in global policy processes. Um, at IDMC, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, we've been monitoring internal displacement since 1998, but really systematically been able to monitor disaster-related and, and therefore also climate-related displacement since 2008. Um, so this is kind of 13 years of data, which doesn't allow us really to talk about uh, major trends vis-a-vis -vis climate change, but it allows us to do other things, particularly in combination then later also with, um, with the talk mentioned uh, with uh, risk assessments. It allows us to, first of all, unpack the displacement data that we have. And as Tessa was already referring to the large percentage of um, disaster events being weather related, same is the case for our disaster displacement events. Um, almost 90% are weather related, but this does not mean they're all climate related or climate change related. Uh, uh, some of them are, they will be shaped in the future and already are shaped in terms of you know, the increase in, in, in frequency and intensity of hazardous events. Um, but of course, not all of them are. And also we have heard already before and everyone knows, working on the subject knows um, uh, climate is, is just and climate change impacts are just one variable in the equation um, of hazard, uh, vulnerability, and exposure. So we can unpack the data a bit more. We can also get better with the data that we already have in assessing the both the economic and also the non-economic impacts of displacement. Again, uh, UNDRR has been good at assessing uh, economic losses related to disasters. 
but displacement really is on nobody's balance sheet right now. So that's also one of the reasons why it's still off a lot of the policy agendas particularly at the national level. Uh, we have looked at the economic impacts of internal displacement uh, in a number of countries and then also estimated global figures. And this is really very conservative uh, estimates based on direct cost only. And even so, costs associated with internal displacement across the globe in 2019 amounted to almost 20 billion uh, in that year alone. And in some countries, specifically also related to, uh, to droughts and floods, uh, so for example, droughts in Somalia, uh, these costs really accumulate to a significant amount of uh, a country's GDP. So they're a real financial burden. And I don't know um, in the context of the EU adaptation strategy, does anyone know, do we have any figures on the actual costs and economic impacts of displacement, even be it temporary displacement, evacuations, et cetera, uh, uh, that are related to disasters and climate impacts. I, I've not come across a data set like that. If, if anyone has it, please let us know. Maybe now is the time to do a study like that. We know that high income countries aren't spared. So we did a study on the Australian bushfires um, and the impacts uh, of displacement there on um, lost productivity. And it was significant. It amounted to more than US uh, dollars. I think, yeah, it was US dollars, not Australian dollars. Uh, 500 per person per day of lost uh, employment due to, or, or labor, due to uh, being displaced and not in their, in their uh, location of, uh, of labor or of work. And in addition, the cost of covering housing for those displaced or those having lost their homes and having to flee was estimated at around $50 million for, the, for just one year alone. So again, this is an additional, significant additional burden on communities but also on, on national economies and, and something that we need to get better into taking into account. Um, but let me get to the strategy itself and highlight just a few points in relation to, as you had asked, uh, you know, the work that we do and also to some of the points I've already raised. I think there are a lot of really commendable um, items in this strategy and, and really relevant to displacement. The first I'd like to pull out is, is that it really clearly says that, that we need to better get better at understanding the interdependence between climate change, ecosystems, and the services that they provide. And of course, in the context of displacement, this is particularly uh, critical. It's, it's often this, this interdependencies and, 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 and interlinkages that drive displacement. Of course, displacement occurs sometimes directly with, in, in the context of loss of territory, but more often it's really triggered by an erosion of in, livelihoods of essential ecosystem services, such as water and, and food, et cetera. And we've already heard before of so, such instances from our colleagues. Um, so we're getting better at, at modeling and, and assessing and studying climate, environmental, and also economic tipping points in these regards. But what's still missing, uh, and, and I should mention this work in particular, also PIC has been actually uh, in the lead and also recognizing where the gaps are, because one of those gaps and what's still missing is understanding how that then interrelates or accumulates into social tipping points. And, and what I mean with that is really how individual and cultural concepts of risk risk perception, but also of opportunity, uh, shape decisions on mobility. And we're really happy to be able to be part of a, uh, another Horizon 2020 uh, supported big consortium. I think PIC is, is also part of that. We're so many that we almost lose track on who's in that, but led by the Hugo Observatory at the University of Liège uh, that looks precisely into these types of uh, accumulation of risk over time, but then these tipping points and, and, and thereby under expand our current risk models that we do have. Um, and provide, we believe, a much stronger basis for national, but also for EU policy making. The second point I'd like to pull out uh, is, is the, the, real rec the, the clear recognition that climate change acts as a threat multiplier uh, and a threat to, to international stability and security. And that this affects particularly, and I quote, people in already fragile and vulnerable situations. And yes, that's exactly what we see and, in, and monitor increasingly now at uh, IDMC from recurring secondary and onward displacement, multiple displacements in Syria of people already displaced by conflict, then having to flee flooded camps, or in Mozambique, where we see a confluence of drivers, but also impacts of ongoing violence, and then floods, cyclones, drones in, in, in successive order. Um, but many other examples uh, exist. So Martin already mentioned Yemen and Somalia earlier on. Those are also, uh, cases where we have this confluence of drivers, but also confluence of impacts so of people already displaced by one type of hazard, conflict or, uh, or disaster, and then being uh, onward displaced. 
So documenting these types of instances in a more quantitative manner on the one hand is something we try to do and, is, and we believe is important to get better at, but also then combining that with, again, more localized qualitative research and really understanding the dynamics that, uh, that are occurring. And it was, again, great to hear the, about the, the project at the very beginning of the session and to inform uh, better policy responses. Then the third point I, I was really particularly happy to see in the strategy is this focus on informal settlements and urban risk. Um, it's again, once again, relevant for displacement in many ways. A significant number of IDPs we see worldwide move from rural areas into urban centers or from smaller towns into capital cities. Um, and it's, it's these towns that, and, and they often end up in informal settlements and marginal to city centers, uh, um, limited access, access to services on exposed uh, and hazard prone lands. Um, and it also at the same time though is, is a situation where they often end up still, despite the, the, the difficult context in which they face, they find themselves, uh, find local integration to be the preferred option for them. So we have urban centers that are already struggling with uh, limited resources and weak governance systems often being further stretched and often generating then uh, new risks on an individual and community level. But as I said earlier, for the national level, same for the municipal level. So new risks are being created and we heard about that earlier. And it's with support from, from the EC's um, DG INPA, uh, we've developed a, an urban displacement, a disaster displacement risk assessment framework and, and really hope that this will become a practical tool for urban planners to consider a displacement risk as part of a broader risk framework and, and really use it as a tool in this broader set of toolboxes that are being on uh, continuously being developed uh, by various city re uh, resilient city networks across the globe. It's currently being uh, tested in the Pacific region and I hope that, uh, that we'll be able to let you know more soon. And then last but not least, I hope I'm not going over time. I think I'm still okay. Um, if we at IDMC could personally thank someone in the EU, we would for really highlighting the central role uh, that in this strategy um, data plays. So really this explicit recognition that data on climate related risks and losses um, uh, uh, plays and, and that any new investment and, and policy decision should be climate informed and future proof. And also the recognition, as it says in the strategy, that at present data uh, that quantifies disaster losses is really unsatisfactory. It's often not recorded, but or we are where we have data, it's it's not being stored in an accessible manner, it's not being analyzed even. Um, and, and we seek to, to fill this gap really at the global level at IDMC, but also increasingly at regional and national levels. And I'll just uh, give one final example because this is again EC supported from INFA, and, and we're really uh, very excited about this. It's now in the second year. It's an initiative that we lead at IDMC in a consortium with IOM and, and the PDD, the Platform on Disaster Displacement in the Pacific region, and where, we're, where five countries are now investing in really getting state-of-the-art climate uh, risk science combined with community-level vulnerability mapping and informing national policies, as well as an ongoing effort uh, to develop a regional framework on human mobility. Um, and, and this is really, we believe, the way to go, in a sense, really combining, you know, what, what is there uh, at, uh, uh, from science, but also in terms of global expertise, but then really led by, uh, by countries themselves, combining it with local data available and then informing policy thereby. So I'll, I'll just close with this. I think I started off saying that displacement remains relatively um, invisible in policy discussions, but I, I would also like to acknowledge it's it's changing rapidly. I don't think I've ever attended um, as many meetings and conferences on a singular topic uh, as I have on this particular subject of the relationship between climate change and migration and displacement as I have in recent months. So there's, there's clearly attention to the issue. There's been a lot of progress under the UNFCCC, the task force on displacement of which um, IDMC is a representative member. Um, uh, also revolutionary regional frameworks on human mobility as we've seen more recently in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also national level advancements, countries really prioritizing now displacement risk um, are huge windows of opportunity. And I think the EU with this new strategy is really uh, well placed to use it um, and we look forward to supporting. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks also for not shying away from, uh, you know, raising technical points like the data storage and so on. That's, I think, also very important that these things are also sort of being uh, said out loud because that's, of course, uh, the, the basis then for, for any, any further steps somehow. So thanks a lot, uh, Bina. That was very insightful. And um, uh, we will now move to Daniel uh, Stadtmüller from the German Corporation for Development Corporation. I, uh, have now made it correct. Sorry for that earlier. Um, so please just go ahead and share your screen or your, no, the, the technical host, please share the screen of Daniel so that he can uh, present. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. I hope you can hear me and thanks so much uh, for having me here today. So um, I uh, work um, uh, in the uh, German Corporation for <laughs> International Cooperation but uh, we are, um, or the, um, this uh, institution hosts the Inter Resilience Global Partnership Secretariat, which is where I work in uh, precisely. And this is what I want to talk to you uh, about today, the Inter Resilience Global Partnership, um, in, I would say, two ways. Uh, one way is sort of the, 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 the partnership approach that we pursue and why we think this is, this is crucial. Um, in terms of the challenges that lie ahead. And secondly, looking at the specific focus in terms of the instruments and the risk management approaches that we pursue and how these fit into sort of the wider adaptation policy. Um, so if we could get to the next slide, please. Um, yes, yeah, so... Um, well, we, we, we've spoken about the risk environment or we've heard from, from, from Katie, from Martin and from, from others. Um, and I, I think I don't need to talk about uh, climate change as, a, as a, the probably the, the biggest challenge of our lifetime um, and that it's, there is a, a, a strong urgency to act now. At the same time, we are dealing with an ongoing uh, pandemic that has led to, to risks compounding climate change intersecting with, with health risk, with pandemic risk. And, and this doesn't only lead to increased vulnerabilities and, and exposures and, and the, the risk of, of, of communities and people, especially poor and vulnerable people, being affected um, uh, from, from, from both uh, risk sources, but it also has led to reduced fiscal spaces, uh, especially among vulnerable countries, to act on climate change and to to uh, to be prepared uh, when disaster strikes. At the same time, we have an institutional environment um, that is quite uh, fragmented. Various stakeholders um, working in this space with different perspectives, different skill sets, and different approaches uh, to manage uh, climate risk. Um, so there is definitely a need for greater co coherence, a need to to coordinate implementation and action efforts globally uh, and a need to, to identify synergies and complementary approaches. And I also found it quite interesting to hear from, from sort of the, the cascading effects and the, the, the unintended consequences uh, that can occur when, when we interfere in one place um, and, and how that may affect uh, other communities, other countries, other regions, other sectors. So there's a need to look at this thing um, from an interconnected global perspective. And this is what we as an Inter Resilience Global Partnership try to do. We are a multi-stakeholder platform driving forward uh, climate and disaster risk finance and insurance. I'll get to that in, in a second. Um, so we tr really try to enable and foster coordinated implementation. We try to bring different agendas together. Uh, we heard uh, before from, from, from Tessa that there's also a need to really, um, to really converge agendas, the climate change adaptation um, agendas, uh, NDCs under the Paris Agreement, national adaptation plans as a further instrument under UNFCCC, but also the Sendai framework um, as a as a as a wider sort of approach uh, in terms of disaster or wider framework on on disaster risk management. Um, so we try to bring various stakeholders together to to set up a common ambition. To, to raise the ambition, to have a joint a agenda, and ultimately also to link needs with solutions, really uh, leveraging the various uh, stakeholders in our partnership. Um, so maybe moving on to the next slide, please. 
So um, climate and disaster risk finance and insurance, and this is what we are focused on. Uh, what is it about? Um, it's about um, ensuring that when disasters strike, there is pre-arranged predictable financing that can support and strengthen early action, disaster relief and recovery. And, this, um, and these instruments need to be embedded in wider climate policy and need to be embedded in wider disaster risk management policy and in wider uh, adaptation planning. Um, so to, to look at the main sort of benefits from, from what we call CDRFI, first of all, it's, uh, we complement or CDRFI instruments can complement other adaptation measures cost effectively. Ideally, we would like to reduce all risks physically by investing in more um, uh, resilient infrastructure, by reinforcing houses, by having early warning systems in place, by getting people out of places when things happen. But we know that this is only possible to a certain extent, and we know that this is not always possible cost effectively, and we need to have mechanisms in place that can absorb residual risk and that can provide financial buffers for people to recover quickly when things happen um, and when and starting where, where risks cannot be reduced. Um, we also know that speed is key uh, when it comes to easing humanitarian shocks, but also economic sh shocks. So the speed at which interventions, disaster response occurs is, is critical and uh, funding is critical. It needs to be there. It needs to be reliably um, uh, and um, quickly um, uh, available when disasters occur. And we're increasingly seeing a shift towards even ex ante anticipatory financing, um, where uh, not only do we get to uh, support countries with payouts uh, days after a disaster strikes, but increasingly even through forecast-based um, approaches through early warning systems before disaster strike. Of course, depending on the type of hazard, but uh, there are certainly um, many risk um, areas or many resources where these approaches are becoming more and more feasible. Um, lastly, um, uh, on main benefits, we support or uh, these instruments support long term fiscal stability. Um, when countries do not have uh, pre-arranged finance for disasters in place. This often leads to um, other budget budgets being reallocated on short notice to address disaster response, having to wait for uh, for humanitarian um, for humanitarian uh, funding to kick in, which often comes too late. So this leads to, in many cases, scarce budgets that were allocated into long-term development, into long-term adaptation and res resilience, having to be uh, reallocated for this short-term disaster response, which has strong impacts on on the long-term fiscal. Um, stability of, of, of these countries. And looking at maybe a bit beyond that on the sort of um, co-benefits that these instruments have within, let's say, wider adaptation planning. Um, risk pricing is something that the insurance industry in particular has been doing for, for a long time, the use of probabilistic models to assess exposure, vulnerability, and the hazard components um, is, 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 um, is definitely something that we need to apply um, to uh, countries, to sovereigns looking to manage disasters better, and to adaptation planning. So incentivizing and enabling risk-informed planning, and also using these tools for, for the wider set of tools within adaptation, not only risk finance and insurance, but also to analyze the different uh, cost benefits of, of uh, various investments in resilience. Um, with that, um, these tools also allow to sort of build resilience baselines. This is something that from, from our discussions and analysis with vulnerable countries, there is a great, really great need to, to, to have resilience baselines in place. Where am I at this point in time in terms of my, my ability to withstand disasters, my ability to adapt to climate change? There's a lack of data in that regard. And the risk pricing tools that the risk financing community and insurance industry can bring to the table can have major benefits here. Um, and this can then lead to, to, to the last point, uh, which is 
the the um, the um, buildup of disastrous management and disastrous finance strategies um, on a risk layering basis where we identify different likelihoods, different severities of events and analyze where do different adaptation um, approaches, risk management approaches, where do they um, um, address these risks most co cost effectively and then by setting up uh, um, a, a strategy that ideally comes with um, at the lowest co cost but with the highest resilience outcome. This is ultimately the, 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 the ideal situation, very challenging, but there are increasingly um, models and, and data that can enable or at least support that. Um, so this is our specific area of, of, of instruments that we promote. There are various implementing programs under the Inter Resilience Global Partnership that promote CDRFI and can implement these solutions on the ground. Um, this includes the World Bank, uh, the UK Center for Disaster Protection, KFW, the German Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the UN Development Program and others. And together we have, um, and now wrapping up because I think I'm running out of time, we have, uh, if we could get to the next slide please, um, we have uh, set uh, a, common, a common vision, a common set of targets and you can see them here. Um, they're related to, to, um, to a number of people that we want to reach annually with these instruments by 2025, including a sub-target on microinsurance of 150 million people protected. Uh, we've all, we're also setting up M&E uh, and monitoring tools to, um, to find out to which extent or what is the per percentage of annual climate and disaster losses that are covered by these instruments and we want to increase that to 10% and also we have a target on the number of countries that we want to support with disaster risk finance strategies but also with active solutions in place and ultimately we work uh, closely with the insurance industry and it's in, I think um, we know that there's vast capital among capital markets among uh, insurance in, within the insurance industry and we want to leverage that that capital to to really support countries when disaster strikes and this the target is five billion uh, of risk capacity offered by the insurance industry for these instruments by uh, the end of 2025 um, i'll stop here and and i look forward to to the further discussion thank you very much yes thanks a lot uh, daniel that was uh, also very interesting and um, please all the panelists now uh, it's more really about short and crisp statements that can also relate to the other. So now we are trying to get more into a debate kind of style. Yeah, so not so much individual presentations, but really the debate uh, should enrail. So maybe the, the first point to, to Daniel uh, about these uh, financing um, instruments uh, that, that are in, available in, in national adaptation planning. And especially how do you that that you presented how do you see them relating to to other components within an adaptation toolkit maybe you can go a bit more into details here uh, and and also having in mind what we now just discussed with the the systemic uh, risk and so on right yeah thank you thank you for that for that question um so there's there's a couple of uh of of instruments there and and they also act on on various different uh uh, different, let's say, levels from from macro to meso to to the micro perspective. I mean, I I, I mentioned in in my presentation that what we the, the the main purpose is to ensure that financing is available when disaster strikes and can be used for either early action um, reconstruction or sort of the the, the long term recovery um, and and depending on on what uh, we're we're sort of uh, looking at or what the 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 actual need is from a country uh, there's different instruments that can be used here uh, some of these are um, on a, on a sovereign macro level uh, instruments of contingent credit or contingent debt where a country can uh, get quick access to cash after uh, a disaster by by sort of activating a loan um, that is dispersed immediately 
um, and then repaying that loan, loan but at pre-arranged conditions as opposed to having to approach capital markets in a distressed situation after a disaster has struck and, and being, being confronted with, with very difficult um, conditions and, and very high borrowing costs. That's one element. The other is to have to set up um, budget reserves, contingency reserves within the government to, to, that can be accessed on, on a, let's say, rules-based approach when, when disasters strike. Um, and there's good examples of that. Mexico, for example, has a, has a certain quota of their GDP going into a disaster fund every year, or not, a, not the GDP, but their national budget, but it's still a, a fixed contribution that goes in there every year and can only be used um, based on a predefined set of criteria for disasters. Um, and then finally, uh, risk transfer based uh, instruments like insurance that um, leverage the capital or can, can access capital uh, within the insurance industry. Uh, some, ex some examples include the African risk capacity, for example, or the Car Caribbean catastrophe risk insurance facility. So these facilities, they're basically set up like, like insurance companies um, that provide insurance policies to different countries. And these countries can, can buy insurance from this, these risk pools um, that are index-based. So what it means is they don't, they don't rely on a long-term assessment of losses after an event, but they look at, um, at satellite-based or, or on-the-ground measurements of, of the disaster, which are readily available, and then compute uh, or through an index um, can calculate what is the payout that needs to be uh, dispersed. And this can happen very quickly, within days. And the advantage of this, these risk pools is that they can buy reinsurance from the, let's say, diversified insurance markets at a at a um, cost-effective rate, and that leads to sort of a, a diversification of risk on a global level. Um, so those are this is the specific um, the specific uh, set of instruments. It's important to note that there are co-benefits with early warning systems, with elements of preparedness that they need to go hand in hand with risk reduction in a physical sense, investing in infrastructure, better housing, better building quality, etc. And this is part of a, an integrated. Uh, adaptation and risk management strategy. So ultimately, convergence of this space into the wider adaptation space is, is crucial. Okay, thanks a lot. That that was very uh, uh, useful. And now I wanted to move a bit to another point by having a, a sort of a joint question, more or less, for uh, Tessa and Binai. And and I would like to quote the the, the adaptation strategy to that uh, to that first. So there is a sentence in in this chapter uh, that the EU will promote subnational, national, and regional approaches to adaptation with a specific focus on adaptation in Africa, small island developing uh, states, and least developed countries. And I wanted to ask you because we have talked a lot about these remote impacts and cascading impacts in the beginning, um, whether these world regions that are outlined here are actually actually the ones that you also think Europe should pay special attention to, or uh, how? What are there other regions that that are um, particularly relevant uh, in, in in this in this setting? Let's say. So uh, maybe uh, Bina, you can start, and then Tessa, you can build on that. Um, and and of course, you can bring in uh, different elements uh, related to that. You just not only need to give names of countries or so. Yeah. Thanks, Christopher. And no, I, I think I, I will refrain from naming any countries, but instead say I, I do think that the EU adaptation strategy is focusing on the right regions here when we're talking about really reaching the most vulnerable, as we've discussed earlier. Um, at the same time, I think maybe it's, it's now it's less about just where, but also how and what are the existing approaches that we can build on, because I do think also that a lot of it and why I like a lot of what how it's been phrased in the strategy, it is about really make, connecting the dots now ultimately. So bu building on existing capacities at the national level. So I think if anything, you know, the last year has also taught us and the current situation that you know this whole system that we've set up of um, international support has to change uh, and 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 also international collaboration and it really has to be countries, local actors in the lead. And what does that mean for the way we then operate? And I do think that the EU has a huge role to play 
in terms of taking a lead and building, you know, showing how its own um, decentralization efforts and capa building capacity at local levels can uh, teach lessons, but then also supporting directly financially uh, in those places, uh, building up basic local capacity. Often we're talking when we're talking about adaptation and addressing displacement or whatever it is, it is about basic administrative capacity in many instances as well. I was talking about data uh, issues. I mean, they're linked to those as well. Um, so I, I do think that we should really look at some of the basics and and not go, not go back to business as usual in this way. So as soon as we can travel again, we'll be all over the place, but really, really try and, and, and rethink and, and hear the strategy um, uh, hopefully will also go in that direction. At the international level, I think as well, um, some of the regions that the e, uh, EU, uh, EU is now focusing on, of course, have been highlighted also under the UNFCCC and the work that we've done under the task force on displacement in particular also has been coming back to, of course, LDC, SIDS, uh, Africa. Um, but I think it's, it's not just, the, again, the geographic regions, but then the instruments that we have and the institutions we've set up. So, what, you know, we have adaptation as a pillar. We've got, I think Martin has commented on that in the chat. I, I invite you to look at it. And then loss and damage, and there has to be much more interlinkage between these two types of uh, uh, you know, instruments and, uh, and the discussions under those as well. Again, the placement is under loss and damage, but of course we're talking here about adaptation and its different scale. So that's another area. And then the tools, and maybe relating, building on what Daniel had been discussing, and the, the risk, I, I just framing the, the issues um, in, in the context of risk. And, and we are really behind on that, I think, in the displacement community. I mean, the insurance community, of course, is way advanced, but there are probabilistic risk models that can be applied to different aspects of adaptation in local settings as well. And it doesn't have to be all sophisticated models every time, but they can be combined with more, more um, uh, local tools and, and approaches. And I think that that's key because that's about creating the incentives, uh, maybe the, for creating the type of level of investment that Martin again was talking about, you know, where do, would really the political will for a Marshall Fund type of um, uh, effort now come from if we're not able to show not just what is at stake, but also what can be done. So let's, and, and within, in, within modeling what, uh, uh, you know, what the projections are and then looking at what can be done, maybe we should put in a stronger effort. And I think, the, again, the EU can lead on this because of its understanding of risk as a you know, the role of vulnerability within the, the risk equation is really to move beyond just the climate, such a strong focus on climate modeling, but really modeling vulnerability better. So what is it, you know, what, it, what if we were focusing on if well-being improves by X, Y, Z by 2030? You know, we have SSPs, I know, and the shared socioeconomic pathways in the scenario, but that they're limited. They're like two indicators or well, a few. But what if we really look at well-being and how that could change over time and how that would reduce you know, the impacts, the negative impacts, the, 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 the crisis, the disasters and displacement? Maybe um, this is something that the EU could lead on. Thanks. Yeah, now you got me all uncomfortable with your last comment about modeling the vulnerabilities because we are trying so hard for so long. But I, I understand and I fully uh, agree on your point. Um, Tessa, please give us your, your perspective again on first the regions and then the wider the wider scope, please. Thanks a lot, uh, Bina. That was very nice. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think that Bina um, said it very well. Um, I, but because in well, the, the strategies or the regions that have been addressed in the, the strategies are, are definitely um, good regions to, to, to focus on. Um, and what's important here is also the, the, the um, realization that uh, every country is impacted by climate change. Um, so it's, it's really important that we have um, that in, in mind, in, and and as we've seen, um, uh, the effects um, uh, well, well within Europe um, are, are, are 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 being well, enhanced, and um, but that's why it's also very good that we have this international dimension. That also um, within the EU adaptation strategy, they, it was mentioned that um, it's 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 looking outwards because, of course, those effects with this whole cascading situation, as well explained by. By, um, by Barton and Cathy really um, also 
come back to to the EU um, in itself. So it, it, it's it's very good that we that there is this look at um, the, at the the broader picture, um, and we really need to also ke keep in mind the importance of uh, uh, the the local level. Um, this is something that um, is 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 crucial to to really also support. Um, we also support the local level, the national level, the uh, the regional level. Um, like there's a lot that can be done also regionally. Um, we we have a project that we're working on um, together with uh, uh, well, financed by DJ Inpa um, in Central Asia, uh, where we also try to um, uh, enhance the resilience of that region because they are facing um, the same type of, of threats and, and to really see how we can address this. Um, uh, and within this project, it was also um, well, it was a project that started before COVID and like now with COVID where we've kind of integrated um, these aspects to really uh, be able to to, to have um, uh, yeah, a, a, a bigger picture while building back from this situation because we, we really need to make sure that um, we have the, 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 uh, the tools in, in place also to be able to ensure that moving forward, we um, do build a more resilient society, um, and I, I think that uh, yeah, there, it, there's there's a lot that we can work with um, on, on on that point. And also within the the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction um, that we are going to be holding in in um, November, this is also something that we're really very much going to address because again, it comes back to um, how do, or how are we going to finance this? Um, this is a very big very big question um, that 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 needs addressing. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, there there within the EU adaptation strategy, there are um, like points on on that as well. But it really it needs to be unpacked further, like practically how are we going to do it? Um, yeah, also in in terms of um, well the 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 impact uh, of um, the well the, or the integration of this strategy within other strategies within the the, the EU, such as through how, how is it going to be reflected through the climate diplomacy? Um, it's all very interested uh, interesting to 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 see this. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot, Tessa, um, for your for your perspective here. Um, very useful. And um, now turning to Martin, I mean, Martin, you have replied already to so many questions in the chat. I, I still have one. Uh, um, you have been very supportive when, or you were happy when I said, okay, this focus on systemic uh, uh, risks and so on is now there um, and, and working for resilience in, in a general sense. So I just wanted to ask for your very, uh, let's say, personal or institutional perspective. Why, where do you put the emphasis on uh, when, when working for resilience in, in a large international uh, um, organization, corporation, such as the, the, the Red Cross Red Crescent. Uh, so maybe you could give us your perspective on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I think it, it, it partly also answers some of the questions um, that, that are still outstanding. Um, um, I actually really liked the question from Josias Block, uh, what would you tell a finance minister in Africa to invest in the one thing or the other thing? And I think one, one um, perspective also from our practice on the ground in local communities, but also in our, our national disaster management planning in our global work in the IFRC, is to integrate all of these issues. So it's not an either or between improving response capacity or investing more in uh, local communities, awareness of changing risks and ability to adapt. It, it, it's all connected. And you should not do one project for one thing and then think you fixed it. it, it we, we, we cannot afford uh, to, to have those silos anymore. Uh, so in response to Hannes' uh, question um, on um, the, the barriers, I, I still see so many of these silos in practice, you know, and we, we are getting all the right wording, including in this strategy. Uh, but I think in practice, uh, the implementation of those good, good um, intentions is still, I mean, we can all identify a couple of siloed uh, individual projects, including the, the great research projects that, that were just mentioned that are, that are going in this direction, but they're the exception and not the rule. And we cannot afford them to be the exception anymore. Uh, and I think that that applies also to that question of the green and resilient recovery. Um, you know, you hear Kristalina Georgieva talking about it. You hear heads of state talking about it. But if you look at what's happening on the ground in our own countries, I mean, my own country, the Netherlands, is 
um, speeding up the uh, the uh, uh, the widening of highways because it, it creates jobs to, for people to 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 work on infrastructure. Where actually everyone's working on home at home and wants to stay working at home, so we have much less need for for highways. And that is, I think, just one example that is emblematic of how it's going around the world. We're actually failing to achieve these things. Now. If you ask me what I then do in my own network, actually much of the focus is locally because most of our response is locally, most of our work is local. Um, so while I think 10 years ago, a much bigger proportion of our efforts was towards influencing, for instance, this adaptation strategy or influencing the discussions in UNFCC, I think most of those building blocks are there. So that's also really my response. Now that the strategy is there, we really cannot afford anymore to put nice words on paper and to have nice speeches by leaders being proud of what they've put on paper. We need to get to very, very rapid scale up of implementation of all these good intentions. I think it's better formulated than ever before. The ambition is, is, is there, but it needs to be followed up, not just at the level of one strategy, but by all these different pieces. And it is all the, the directorates in the commission, but also all the member states who could take inspiration from this. And, we then translate that to our local level. And again, that's, I think, exciting. We had a, um, a summit that was actually originally going to be taking place in Geneva and where we would have leadership from our National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies from, from around the world, probably flying to Geneva to have a meeting together on how we actually um, respond to the, the, the growing climate crisis, which is one of our top five priorities for the coming decade. Partly already because we felt it wouldn't be right to fly so many people to Geneva, but of course then um, made even more necessary with COVID. We made it into a virtual summit where we had 10,000 people um, uh, having these discussions together, including the Secretary General of the IFRC with the local volunteer in Kiribati uh, trying to figure out what, what to do on the, on, on, with the coastal challenges there. Um, and I think it is actually that type of interaction that we need but then also the very concrete translation of these global commitments, say at the level of the IPRC Secretary General in these very practical um, solutions on the ground. We're having these discussions also, for instance, with the donor community, including many in, in the uh, directors of the European Commission. But again, I think so far the, the steps are small ones compared to the scale of the challenge that we face. Thank you. That's yeah, I, I mean, I, I basically agree a lot, uh, but of course that means there's a lot of work to do. Um, thanks a lot, Martin. I wanted to pick up uh, or sort of to give, to pick up one point you made um, on, on the interdisciplinarity and these research projects are, you know, too much the, the, um, the exceptions rather than the norm. And I would like to ask uh, Katie and Bart to maybe reflect a bit on that from, from their perspectives. Also, of course, you know, with this background, I mean, you know we, how, we, how we work in the projects. And maybe you can also pick up uh, Bart for the, the question by uh, Francois uh, from the chat uh, on whether uh, and why the, uh, the projects do not really include African partners. And Katie, you can reply for Cascades or I can also do that, how we, how the, let's say the, the benefit sharing and so on is organized there. Um, yeah, but I would maybe to give you these two as, as, a, as a sort of uh, entry point, and then you can, of course, uh, reflect also on what the others have been saying before. So please, uh, maybe Katie, you can start and then Bart, you can follow up. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Christopher. Um, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about um, sort of this distinction between specific adaptive responses versus more integrative resilience oriented responses. So I'll just maybe say a quick thing on that and then I'll try and I'm gonna try and answer succinctly uh, three of the questions in, in, in the chat. Um, so I think, I think it's really early days when it comes to thinking about the kinds of adaptation options that could best kind of manage this next generation of climate risks, of, of, of cascading climate risks. Um, but I think the kind of the high levels of uncertainty associated with their kind of propagation through these really complex systems uh, mean we need to design adaptation options that are resilient in the face of, of gaps in our knowledge and understanding. We, we just can't afford to wait until we have all the answers. Um, and I think they're kind of, they're, you know, they are complex, they do cross borders, um, and that really calls for responses that strengthen systemic resilience. So identifying and targeting what some of these key risk drivers might be, these kind of choke points in these systems, uh, and, and identifying solutions that help to raise levels of, of coping and, adapt and adaptive capacity kind of across the board of the systems within which they're embedded. 
Um, so then just to just to move on to some of the questions in the chat, thanks so much for all these great questions. There was one around how we in Cascades are aiming to inform nutrition policy and engage with agricultural uh, sustainable food systems and fisheries. Uh, we're still quite early uh, in, the, in the Cascades project, but it's absolutely our intention to reach out and engage with stakeholders across a number of policy arenas, from trade uh, to food security to foreign policy to those working in the financial sector, and really try and leverage some of the findings from the project to draw out the, the impacts for our economies, environments and societies, and, and what some of the resulting policy implications might be across those different sectors. And at SCI, we have some upcoming research on the implications of cascading climate risks uh, for global food commodity flows. Uh, so look out for that in a few months time. Uh, and just wearing my other hat for the Adaptation Without Borders, um, we're a new partnership focused on trying to strengthen resilience to these sorts of risks and spur more regional and global cooperation on adaptation. We're, we're also looking to engage in the upcoming UN Food System Summit and, and raise the implications of these sorts of risks for food security. Um, there was another question around how far has the conversation moved on from how more developed nations will help Africa to how we can work more closely together in finding collaborative solutions um, that are also reflected in our policies and strategies. So really great, great question. Um, just wanted to point to an analysis that ODI led, uh, the Overseas Development Institute led in 2019 uh, on this topic, which found that um, 13 LDCs sort of alluded to or explicitly recognized cross-border risks and impacts in their NDCs, and a further 34 uh, LDCs did so in their NAPAs. Um, and I think this, this raises the, the point that countries are beginning to recognize these and, and there are implications uh, certainly for, for, for lower income and developing countries. But SEI has also done some analysis at a global level, looking at national level exposure to these sorts of cascading climate risks. And that really shows that all countries are exposed to these, regardless of their levels of wealth, of, of power, of influence. And, and while some countries might have considered themselves relatively immune to, to the direct impacts of climate change, they, they really can't do so when it comes to these sorts of cascading climate risks. And it shows the need for all countries to work together to strengthen the resilience of our systems, to, to recognize the, the common challenges we face and the opportunities for solutions to kind of harness mutual benefits. So I hope sort of greater recognition of, of the existence of these sorts of risks, which we, which we all face collectively would would move that, that conversation on long overdue. Uh, and then I finally, I just wanted to answer the question, if I may, uh, that was posed on what, sh what should the EU's priorities be for UNFCCC, COP26 and beyond. Um, and I'd like to make a couple of points here again around <laughs> cascading climate risks. So first, that I think there's lots of scope for this issue to be addressed more comprehensively. Uh, under the UNFCCC and the, the EU has a key role to play here in helping raise this issue up the agenda. Um, I think you know, we, we've had a lot today around the, the need for, for adaptation action to be driven by local actors from the bottom up and would absolutely agree with that. But actors at all levels need to be equipped with, with the tools and knowledge that provide them with this global outlook to, to really get a full a picture of the range of risks that, that we face. And, and I think without this, we'll really continue to miss opportunities to catalyze more cooperation on adaptation, um, as well as kind of those sorts of incentives that could increase ambition uh, on, on adaptation. And the Paris Agreement outlined this, this vision for this global goal on adaptation that we have, you know, really, we've got to make much more headway on operationalizing it. I think this presents a key opportunity to better address these issues, uh, as does the global stock take, uh, which you know, should be assessing our levels of progress in building resilience, not only to direct climate risks, but also these sorts of cascading risks. So COP26, I think, presents a real opportunity for the EU to, to support initiatives and partnerships, partnerships that are building resilience to these sorts of risks and, and to really champion regional and global adaptation as, as essential to addressing climate risk. And then secondly, uh, I just want to say that I think several EU member states have already started to assess their exposure to cross-border risks. And um, there's a really interesting study that Infras uh, did for Germany uh, that's just been released, look, which concludes that the economic consequences of climate change through foreign trade alone 
uh, equal to the economics of uh, the economic impacts of climate change that Germany faces within its national borders. And they also pointed to a number of similar studies for the UK and, and Switzerland and Austria. But none of these have found a natural home for adaptation to these sorts of risks within the government architecture. So they, they kind of go beyond what we often think of as adaptation and, and the attribution of risk ownership. Um, so who is responsible for managing uh, and, and, and who, is a, who is accountable for managing these risks, especially when they span the sort of public and private spheres, it's really unclear. So I think this is a key point for the implementation of the EU adaptation strategy. It's not enough just to recognize these. We need to clarify who will be tasked with, with managing these, with monitoring and evaluating them. You know, these risks are already detectable, but, but managing them is currently no one's job and that has to change. Thank you, Katie, for this very comprehensive sort of answering many of the different aspects here. Bart, can I directly hand over to you and then we move into the final round, basically. So please, Bart. Yes, thank you. Yep. Allow me to, to, to pitch in a bit different perspective. And that is, I'm, 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 my background is from a more uh, meteorology. I'm a quantitative uh, forecaster. And um, I'm in intrigued by, by the complexity of this whole uh, cascading systems. And I'm even more intrigued by in introducing all the elements that it is not only climate, it's not even only disasters, it's also displacement, it's, all, it's trade, it's, it's risk ownership. It's getting pretty complex. And I like complexity, that, that is not, not a big deal. But as we all know, a, a complex world has many degrees of freedom. So it can go, it can go everywhere, you know? And that is also, I think, a bit at the risk of, of uh, loading, charging these ambitions too much. If, if, we, if we impose, say, all kinds of requirements to increase resilience, for instance, for, for, for at that local level or at the regional, national, and then indigenous level, that of course is, is, is uh, there's no, that, that is no regret action. But resilience in itself already is a complex thing because it, it really depends on how you define it. I mean, say a coping uh, a response that is very well tuned towards, say, a, a short or midterm relief to a disaster can work out to be quite detrimental on the longer term or for the neighbors or whatever. Mart had a very good example that uh, where we make a big sturdy reinforcement for coastal flooding somewhere downstream and people get exposed. If this all is predictable, if this all is foreseeable, we can sort of think of a, of a mental framework where we can try to minimize this and to reduce it and that we factor in the neighbors uh, or we factor in future generations or whatever. But part of the problem is that it is not all predictable or even foreseeable. And, it, and another part of the problem or a problem, it's, it's not a problem, but at least the property is, it depends a lot on how you define resilience it depends a lot whether you factor your your own family more heavy than the than the people that you don't know or when you uh, f find health more important than 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 happiness or whatever it is also very value value laden value based which is which is good which which is why we live and that's that's part of it but it is i i, I have a bit of hesitation i i, I to 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 try to think in, in a world where we think, okay, this, this direction, that's the best. I worked in meteorology to do, say, uh, um, uh, high extreme weather alerts, whatever. And we already had to consult, say, impact, an, an impact management team that would warn us, hey, if you have a big snowstorm, if it's in the Sunday evening and no one's on the street, it shouldn't be a code red alert. But if it's on a Monday morning when people aren't driving, then it's a code red alert, you see? Meteorologically, it's exactly the same event, but the societal impact is totally different. And so from an academic point of view, uh, we, 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 we listen to these ambitions and requests and, and requirements, but we also sometimes push back the question, okay, we, we do want to model vulnerability or we do want to do impact forecasting, but please give us your specifications of what is vulnerability and what is the impact you want to map? And I don't want to, you know, uh, spoil the party. And I really are eager to embrace all these concepts. But I just wanted to flag this sort of alert. Hey, there's nothing for free. We have to realize 
in a complex world, we are facing complex decisions. And at the end, to come back to one of the questions in the chat, that uh, uh, there was a suggestion that we should bring in more machine learning or in intelligent art or artificial intelligence, etc. That's indeed what we do in, in, in this, we, because we realize uh, uh, even in the quantitative world, in the physical world, in the, in the world where you can touch things, our models are imperfect and you do need advanced statistical procedures to get the information out of the data. And we're really looking forward to bring in, say, a bit more softy data as well, values data, or even the data where uh, um, uh, Bina was referring to, uh, the, the displacement or the, 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 the cost or the, the damage or whatever, to bring that in via machine learning also to find optimal solutions. But again, what you, what you get out of it is partly what you put in. So again, please be specific on, on what you want to optimize. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Bart. I think we have a more or less direct re reaction from Martin uh, to that. At least you raised your hand. In, I just wanted to clarify because now also Bart, um, it, it would, there were maybe too many questions, but there was this one question uh, about uh, why the EU projects do not really include African partners. And I think I can simply reply uh, on behalf of both projects maybe, uh, because I think it's a very important point and you will see in the uh, in, in the preparation phase of the projects, uh, there is also some, some considerations about that. So let me just quickly uh, say that. So uh, as a sort of, as a funding mechanism, there, there are not, not all the EU calls are somehow uh, accessible to non-EU uh, parties, let's say. So that's the first point. But of course, since in Cascades and Receipt, we were well aware of these connections that exist. Um, there is, of course, a component of, of, of engagement and of capacity building. And that, that is not, at least in Cascades, it's not visible through the partners, but it's visible through our stakeholder board and through the engagement that we have in thematic workshops in the country. So we have uh, identified certain uh, let's say regions uh, where we work and they are mostly in, let's say, in, in, in Northern Africa uh, and, and, and in, the, in the Sahel and so on, in, in Cascades. And then we have a specific process with local partners that are subcontractors and then they get uh, sort of involved through these workshops. And that's just the way the funding system works, I would say, for this specific call. There are other uh, projects, for example, my colleagues are involved, then, it's, uh, then there is even sort of the funding for a direct partnership available, but that's then another funding line. So just to, to clarify that. But I think in both projects, there is as much as possible this capacity building and, and sort of engagement element directly within the uh, countries uh, that exists. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, Martin, please, uh, directly to you. I'm sorry for, for stepping in here, for leaving my role for a moment. Please, Martin, go ahead. You had a direct re reaction maybe to... Yeah, uh, yeah. Th two points, actually. One was following up on what you just said. So first of all, I recognize that reality in these projects, but I think it is an important message to RTD or to however we shape the implementation of this international component of the adaptation strategy beyond what RTD does in Horizon Europe. And it might be that other uh, directorates need to be involved in that as well. But I think we need something like a Horizon Europe that is explicitly aimed also at creating these knowledge networks and the ability also of uh, researchers in those countries. Because it's not, I, I think it's the reality in these calls, for instance, that you subcontract local partners to then organize uh, the, the, the engagement there. But what we really want at some point is people in those countries to have those networks and be part of those projects also as, as, as full researchers and to have their own networks to stakeholders where they can sp speak that language and sort of remain there in those countries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's all just for all of us. And I don't know if RTD is listening in, uh, but I think that th there's work to be done there to shape these calls, but possibly even to shape the way we create these calls um, in the future. Um, a second point is, I think the, 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 the point you make is, is very important, Bart, and very valid. Um, so first of all, on the machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think it's, it's a great tool, but it can also be a black box that sort of takes the decision-making feeling away from the people that need to actually get a better feeling for, for how things are interacting. And they often have a very good sense for that. So some, somehow we need to connect those. And in general, I think um, the, the modeling is... We, so we need more modeling to understand these different drivers, to also be confronted with the potential surprises, the nonlinearities. But at the same time, quite a lot of what's needed on the ground is common sense. And there are things on the ground that can be addressed without all that modeling. 
So to name one example, our work 10 years ago, we had no funding from the international, so including from ECHO, for instance, there was long-term disaster preparedness funding, which allowed us to sort of prepare baseline capacity to be able to respond. But otherwise, all the money came in after a disaster has ha had happened. You get an early warning, you know it's going to get bad. Well, sorry, you need to find out a funding for it. We cannot do that from our humanitarian funding. That is something that could be fixed and has been fixed. And there is a science component to that. We're now also seeing scientists in the Met offices in those countries doing some of the research, getting better, but, but also themselves identifying which pieces of the impact forecasting are a priority for them, right? So rather than us in a European project thinking of that in a dialogue with Brussels, it's the Uganda Met service with the Uganda Red Cross that's thinking about what would actually be really important to have. And sometimes simpler, simpler is better. Uh, and in the end, that's up to the people that need to make the decisions there locally. So I think um, it, it's a two-way street. I think one, um, having these networks, when we try to capture all the complexity, that then also informs the next steps on how we approach these things at large, but also really identifying where sometimes really simpler is better. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of simple barriers that can be moved out of the way. Yeah, well taken. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, uh, I actually, I'm, uh, we are reapproaching the end of the session, but I think I really would like to give uh, Tessa, Vinay and Daniel the floor because uh, I think um, Bart and Casey and Martin, you have now touched upon the points that I had actually kind of reserved for the closing. So I think that that's fine. I wanted to ask the panelists, uh, one, to reflect on this AI uh, and, and technology thing because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting and, and it will, you know, how people are picking it up. Of course, it's fancy, but maybe it's also not always useful. So I think that would be one important point and, and you don't need to react to, to, to all of my points that I'm now making. And the second point maybe um, that was also brought up in, in the questions, but I think that deserves attention from, from more on the panel. Uh, I think Martin has already applied this question and, and Casey on, on what is now then the priorities for COP26. I think it uh, would be very nice um, from, from the three of you now, starting with Tessa, uh, to hear, let's say, a one minute short statement on you know, either of the two topics or, of course, your own reflection on, on any other aspect. And then I would start the closing of the event. But please, uh, Tessa, go ahead. Thank you, um, and very good points um, and questions. Um, so I'll, I'll pick up on the last one. Um, the priorities for COP26, this is, well, absolutely huge, but um, of course, uh, <laughs> climate change adaptation as a whole really needs to be at the forefront there. Um, and it will be extremely uh, important to, to see how also it, there will be some um, uh, more tangible results coming out of this. This, this is something that I think would would be a pri priority to, to really be seen um, from that. Um, also from the disaster um, risk reduction point of view, um, this uh, th this this coherence between the two agendas really also should should be very much present there because um, we we really need to be able to to address uh, the the risks of uh, of, of climate change um, uh, and um, I, I think that this this would be very uh, like very important but of course there are so many different elements that that need to be addressed within this this point it's it's hard just to to, to pick um, some but uh, another point that uh, kind of links back to to the other discussion um, is is uh, to really have um, risk informed decision making or or just in, informed decision making um, it was very important to have uh, data to, to really have that supported to have the science behind it um, I think that the EU adaptation strategy also very much like points to that importance of really enhancing the knowledge um, uh, around around uh, um, decision making that will scientifically based decision making um, around uh, um, the the increase in uh, in data that we we are able to to collect to be able to put together such a um, uh, an, an informed policy making process uh, and and this is this is something that well also at UNDRR we we support. Um, countries to um to to with the data loss databases um uh, but this is something that very much needs to be um en enhanced also to to get a better picture um uh, of 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 well of the disaggregated data of, ev of everything to be able to to move forward um I'll, I'll stop here because i see that the time is running um but so, so thank you very much it really very interesting also uh, all the different points from my fellow panelists so uh, <laughs> thanks yeah, thanks a lot, Tessa. And uh, maybe, uh, Bina, you can uh, 
go ahead with a short statement that's that's on on those two points or either of them yeah, as you no, wish no, happy to thanks first on the on the use of technology and new approaches i think they're they are great and we're using them all the time as was already mentioned i mean for particularly an army key for filling gaps and validation so it's not necessarily also just about generating new data but it's, uh, but it's about generating uh, complementary data and insights that can allow us to make more sense of the other pieces in the puzzle, so, so to say. Um, and we should never, of course, rely on any one source as any good researcher would know. So that's kind of an additional tool in our toolbox that we're using right now. Um, and in terms, and, and same for modeling, we should never rely on one particular model. And as Martin rightly said, we don't need to have all the complexity modeled in every particular situation. And I do think what Bart raises there is critical because it brings me back to the kind of point that we've been discussing in the disaster risk reduction realm for years and years is that shocks of this nature that we're talking about are not exogenous, they're endogenous, they're, you know, they're made within, you know, they're, they're systemic as we said, but they're really created uh, through every single um, development decision made, you know, historical uh, developments, etc. So there are political issues at play here that, you know, we need to in a sense, not just recognize, but then maybe if coming to, uh, to COP and these types of you know, policy processes, be it at the national level, but then also at the international level, it's more about um, really using this space for contestation, let's say, and to, to understand the political priorities and incentives of the different actors, and, we, and, to, and to use those processes that are available to us to build consensus and agree in some kind of common sense of what these priorities should look like. And for me, I mean, where there is no consensus, and that should be the focus of COP26, is financing. I mean, that has to be the focus. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. And that's also a nice transition transition set off to you, Daniel. Uh, so maybe give your, your sort of final uh, perspective here, and then we'll move into the closing. Yes, thank you very much. And um, I, I guess on, on, on both points, um, uh, technology and, and AI, I think um, we've seen uh, massive improvements, uh, the, the use and the, the way that we can process big data obviously makes um, uh, climate modeling, climate for forecasting um, um, much more um, effective and, 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 and accurate. Um, and I, I think we, we, we have to do a better job at, at um, connecting um, especially the vulnerable countries to these tools um, on sort of wider AI applications, things like you know blockchain and and many many of the sort of trendy <laughs> um, uh, fintech intratech uh, approaches that are coming up. Um, I think there's definitely an applicability, but I would be cautious to to sort of push technologies without uh, looking at the demand first. Um, and then on on the on COP26 priorities, I think one one priority I would like to highlight is financing, um, not necessarily in terms of increasing financing, um, uh, but mostly in terms of the speed and the 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 um, the operational um, effectiveness with which financing can be made accessible for adaptation in countries. There's certainly a a, a gap in in how uh, the different funding mechanisms are set up to 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 react quickly to to be in line with the urgency that we really face um, and and uh, ultimately to focus on those that are most in need of the, the poor and vulnerable countries um, and and their their exposure um, and then to connect that financing with an increased risk understanding as, as Tessa put it it's it's uh, data is the beginning of, of any strategy and and um, it's what we hear is 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 alongside financing, it's lacking the most. It's an understanding of countries' individual exposure and 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 maneuvering through the different, um, through the through the very uh, diverse um, toolkit uh, mm -hmm. they could have at hand. Thank you. No, thanks a lot. That was uh, very insightful, also, and and I'm very glad that we managed to collect all your feedback, sort of on on these points uh, and. But of course, before we finish here, I would like to thank panelists, of course, 
I think that was really insightful. I'm, I'm very grateful that you sort of brought in your perspective, perspective, but still were very open to, you know, picking up what the others were saying and so on. Uh, I think that that really made this a very lively session. So bye-bye. <laughs>